think that it, Utsi Yitsi, whatever his name is, was just, wasn't just going to visit the next village in the mountains. Uh, he, he, that, that's the direction he was going, so why not? Well, yeah, I mean, who else is he going to do it? Exactly. Hang on a minute. You did me, or I oh, Rich, Richard just disappeared. Oh, God, I thought I was having, a, I thought I was having one of those moments. <coughs> right, OK, we're, 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 we're on the internet now. I'm just going to try. We're still waiting for Anne. For God's sake. She's not, not on in, in a minute. We're, we're starting. Oh, dear. She's probably doing her nails. Yeah. Uh, Rich, Rich, Richard just had to go off then because he had to uh, get a perm done on his hair. Yeah. <laughs> Getting in my eyes. What, the perm or the, or the air? The hair or your glasses? blowing in my eyes. Mm. We've got more people watching online than we have, Blooming, uh, this. Oh, that's great. He just had to go off then because he had to uh, get a perm done on his hair. It's even repeating itself. Oh, we'll give it, give it another, give it, yeah, one more minute, Anne. Anne's a bit of a legend, really, isn't she? Well, she's a one-off. Uh, you can say that again. Definitely a one-off. Do you, do you know? Do you know some some people actually watch this just to listen to what Anne's going to say. <laughs> in, in fact, in fact, she's got a whole pot following on the internet. Apparently, they want an Anne show. Right. So what we what we've done, Richard? We've uh, <coughs> I've, you're you're now the co-host, and basically, um, just try and let Anne Dell or or the Pope or anyone on, okay? Yeah, because she didn't mention coming on tonight, mate. Oh no, she she just said that she uh, she just contacted me. Then she is coming on. All oh, right. So she she's uh, she's she's there. I'll keep an eye out. Oh, hang on. She's just she's just made it. Right, Richard. Have we got any? Have we got any news from you this week, archaeologically wise? No, no, nothing really. Not much it's just all. On. It's all lot. Uh, is is the weather been bad in Barry? Yeah, been blowing a gale. Yeah, and Bridgend. Okay. <laughs> yeah. oh, nobody really cares about Bridgend, really. It's a bit of a tip, anyway. So, Anne, give us some archaeological news before we start. Um, well, I did. Oh, God. I, I mean, I, there's all sorts of stuff coming in, you know. Um, <laughs> but I can't remember it. <laughs> all I remember was um, there was a nice video sent of Roscommon Castle. And um, it was interesting because i mean it's they're just like it's just like wales you know you just get englishmen going over and taking over their castle or building castles actually building castles and then them going falling into ruins and then someone taking them over um but where, 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 oh, where is this again pardon where where's this castle you're describing again? Oh, in um, Ross Common in Ireland. Oh well, it would help if we had knew the country, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it just looks like Carry Castle, you know, or it's got a lot of those casement windows, you know, on it. And uh, I've been there, um, but they had a lot of trouble with the English. <laughs> well, those bloody English they get and everywhere. The don't and oh, I don't know. I don't know really, but um, it's an interesting little uh, video that was on. It just tells you well, it's more to do with 
this morning really to do with like medieval era you know okay okay right what what we need is some news from goff you've got it you've got to give us a bit of news goff well all i had was what that article i sent you from the uh I think it was a telegraph, wasn't it? About Stonehenge. About uh, this... give, yeah, tell us a bit more. Well, I can't remember his name, but you think he's quite good. But um, oh, Darvel, Darvel. Yeah, it's basically uh, looking into. He seems to think that the Stonehenge and the Stonehenge area was aligned with the stars. Uh, oh, uh, basically, yeah. yeah. So that was really what it was all about. Mm. Yeah. The alignment of Stonehenge. Uh, well, yeah, because um, I I noticed that Tumbalum was aligned with Jupiter or someone. You know, is 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 you know they did. That's how they where they built how they decided to build places. I suppose. Remind us where Tumbalum is again. Outside Newport. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's it's sort of Risca, really, on the on you know behind Risca, and um, it's it is an Iron Age hill fort, um, and you know there there were Iron Age people living there, if not even earlier people, but I don't know about the Silures. <laughs> I don't think Rob. Uh, I don't think Carl believes in the Silurians, does he? Well, no. It, it, it's uh, well, base, basically, they they, they are met, they, they do occur on Doctor Who quite a lot. The Silurians. <laughs> well, I suppose they are Iron Age, probably. But the, the the thing is, the thing is, it's like the accepted view now is is that um, lots of when 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 you're looking at the Roman world. The the, the the Romans themselves had to come up um, <clears throat> for names for people. And, and obviously what yeah. we're talking about, the whole of Glamorgan, Gwent, going over towards David Gloucester. Um, all, these, all these people had different names and had different identities. So, so when, when, you've got, when you've got people writing down the history, and, and in, in, in most cases, writing down the history for the first time, that's not always accepted that there was no written history in Britain before the Roman era. But in most cases, it, it is essentially the only time that lots of these names are being written down. And they're basically thinking, right, we'll just give them one name. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's basically what's happening. So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at some images. Oh. Can I just Listen. remind you of, um, I did get the a Siberian Ice Maiden or the Princess of Yukok. It's a female mummy with tattoos from the 5th century BC, Russia. Oh, yeah. But um, I think we have seen her. I think we have seen her and those... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but what 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 date is this from? Quickly, because we have got we've just started. Oh, it's fifth century. It's it's late, you know. Fifth century. Don't you mean the four hundreds? BC. Right. Yeah. I think so, we've done it. we've done it before, you know, but it's not Neolithic. <laughs> okay. Fair. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. It's sort of related to what we did. Ozzy the Ice Age Man. Ozzy the Ice Ice Man. Right. So what we're going to do now, we're we're definitely into it. So, so to, yeah, we've got four people online. That's great. So, I don't know where Dell is. Anyone else coming on? Can you bring them on, Richard? So what we're going to do today? So we we have got. Um, I we yesterday uh, there was a lot of content, and yesterday went on quite a lot, quite quite for a long time. And one thing I'm, I want to do is, is basically had this out with lots of different things we're going to be looking at barrow diggers tonight but first of all I, I want us to come in with a question i actually had relating to stanton moore and the which which we did uh last week when when, when we looked at stanton moore one, one of the questions that i was asked was where people lived 
in relation to the ancient monuments at Stanton Moor. Now, if you look at Bakewell on your little map, um, number 21 is in fact where Stanton Moor is. This is the county of Derbyshire. Now, you, you can quickly um, you, you can quickly work out, this is part of the county of Derbyshire, you can quickly work out that from, from the numbers on the screen, there's quite a lot of sites. So Stanton Moor is not the only Neolithic prehistoric landscape within this, this huge area of, of the Peak District. The Peak District National Park, and that's what we're looking at now. Derbyshire, eat your heart out. Now, the dark areas on there, the, 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 the areas marked Dark Peak, are, are your grit, are your grit stones. Now, this is really important when we're looking at trying to give an answer to this sort of where people were living in relation to the standing stones, the barrows, uh, all these other sort of monumental things within the landscape. But in other words, what we're trying to do is trying to work fix in where people actually lived in relation to these wonderful monuments that we've actually been looking at. And <clears throat> one, one, of, one of the things about um, Stanton Moor, it comes on the back of, of the one I, want to, one I want to mention, because this actually comes up in the other text, in, in, in the sort of Derbyshire, how low, which is number two up above Buxton. Remember that name, you know where it is, um, how low. That comes in later on. Within this landscape, all these numbers, number one, for example, re relates to um, relates to archeological sites or a place known as Carsington Pasture. We're not gonna go through all these. Number 19 on there, if you can look at number 19, uh, which is towards, um, which is just underneath the, the writing at the top, Dark Peak. No, number 19 itself is a place called Mantor. So the wonderful names for this wonderful landscape. We're not going to go through the, these individually. I've got to try and answer the question I was asked. And the answer basically is, is that all the numbers on there represent not just archaeological sites relating to standing stones and, and barrows and carns, um, and henges and, and cursus monuments and all those different things that we've been talking about. What those numbers actually relate to is actually settlements. So you can actually see it's quite a settled and we, we're getting quite a nice picture of what exactly exists from this world. Now, the next image that we're going to look at just briefly, because we're going to look at the barrow diggers after this, the, the um, which, which is basically um, the... Barrow Diggers number eight in the series. Um, and for those that are watching online, um, the, if you look at my other videos, you've got loads of Barrow Digger uh, lectures out there. Now, to try and actually answer this question of where the settlements were and, and what this sort of settlement question means, we look at this, a nice little chart. Now, we can see Stanton Moor there. We know where Stanton Moor is on the map, but all these names here relate to numbers on the map. We don't really need to go through where everything is, right? But we know, interestingly enough, when we look at some images at the end of the, this, this small area of slides, when we've got Dark Peak, the Dark Peak areas on there, that's your grit stone. That's your really old grit stones. And the White Peak are your limestones. So when we, then when we come into the question of pottery and trying to understand pottery from this landscape, right, that sort of answers your question about settlements. So looking at this quite nicely, uh, we, we saw um, Casington Pasture, which was at the bottom there. Casington Pasture number one at the bottom, right? Now, it basically says that... Uh, a Casington pasture, they've got a barrow that's been excavated, part of a number of sites. They found one pottery shirt, and that pottery shirt relates to the early Bronze Age, approximately maybe around 4,300 4, years ago or thereabout. Finding a piece of pottery means that that piece of pottery relates possibly to a settlement. And that's really, really interesting that, that we're, we're actually finding bits of pottery. Now, there's there's another site here which is which is known as Finn Cop, Finn Cop. Um, that's number four, directly in the centre of the screen, just <coughs> slightly north 
of Bakewell on there, sort of towards the, the left of Bakewell. That, <coughs> that's a site marked as a hill fort. Now, what it says there, late Bronze Age pottery, I know we're supposed to be doing the Neolithic period, but lots of these Bronze Age sites relate to an early Neolithic landscape, which is very important. The Neolithic landscape is there underneath the Bronze Age landscape, and the Neolithic landscape uh, is on top um, of the Mesolithic landscape and so on. And, and this is the thing. What, what, we, what we actually start to find is that lots, lots of the settlements that we're really referring to are in the areas known as the Dark Peak. And this, this is rather interesting. And what, 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 were you, what we're finding in this Dark Peak area, for, for example, uh, on, on the sort of um, right-hand side of Bakewell and on the left-hand side, what we're starting to find is lots of evidence of settlements and lots of pottery being found from the early Bronze Age, late Bronze Age, and so on. Now, pottery, again, back to what I said, is a really good indicator that we've got settlements and people living. Because naturally, if people are making pottery, they must be making pottery associated with a settlement. It stands to it, it stands into what we're saying. So this isn't just a, a landscape of memorials. This isn't just a landscape of, of the dead or the ancestors. It's a landscape of the living as well. Everything's mixed in within this world, within, within this landscape, this chart that we have in front of us. So what, we, what we've next got is, is this image here. Now, this is, this is, this is rather interesting. Uh, by, the weather, by the way, the weather is getting worse and worse out there. So, um, mm. so if, if I suddenly fly off into the moonlight, I'll be probably holding my turkey and I'll go off to Never Never Land and I'll, I'll tap my shoes and everything will be fine. So this is a rather interesting um, image. This, this paints out the image quite nicely. Um, and one thing that we can say, oh, and Henry, Henry is actually, Henry's actually online. I can hear you just, okay, fair enough. Don't worry, Henry's online. He's watching us on YouTube. Thank you much, Henry. If you've got any questions to uh, ask Henry, just put them on screen and I'll completely ignore them. Right. So what we've got is that grey area limestone plateau, um, gritstone moors. And the one thing about back then, um, in the Neolithic period, in the Bronze Age, people were living in and around this landscape. And lots of this landscape is 100, 200 metres above, above sea level. It's in an area in the Bronze Age that by the end of the Neolithic period, 4,500 years ago, people had already cut down a large number of the trees. And they were quite happy living within this um, landscape, this very rocky landscape, the gritstone landscape, your sandstone, sandstone and your limestone landscape, your limestone plateau. But what we're talking about is this landscape took a, took a hit. So if you can imagine, you've got agriculture, you've got settlement, you've got a memorial landscape, land of the dead, you've got land of the ancestors, cursus monuments, barrows, standing stones, um, henges, everything's going on. But what happens is there's a massive hit. So we moan and groan about um, um, changes in weather and temperature today. Well, I'm moaning and so is Henry. Um, but what, what we find is that 1,628 years BC, so approximately 3,628 years ago, um, give or take 50 years, you could uh, 50, 60 years or whatever. Uh, because uh, you've, you've got to sort of do the radio carbon dating, whatever. But anyway, the, the point is, um, what happens is that most of this landscape that you can actually see in front of us now is abandoned. And what that means simply is the settled landscape, the agricultural landscape, the memorial landscape with all those standing stones and stuff and the, and the, and the mounds associated uh, with the ancestors, all that landscape is abandoned. So in many ways, when we when we think of when we think of a large number of, of of sort of sites across this landscape, these are the ones that we know about. There's a lot more going on across this landscape. And in fact, thanks to the barrow diggers, we lost lots of the archaeology because they dug into these mounds and didn't record where the barrows actually were. But we won't talk about that. We will actually in a short while. But one next thing I'd like to show you is quite in, is, is rather, rather interesting. And why it's rather, rather interesting, all of this is rather, rather interesting. 
Um, this. What is this? Now, this Blue. is basic. This Blue is John? basically what? Blue John? No, these are cross sections of um, pottery. Oh. <laughs> these are, and you might get a bit of a fragment of Blue, Blue John, but obviously up the um, Yorkshire way, aren't you? So, um, good try. But this is no. actually. No, it's the, in Derbyshire. Is it? I thought it was in Yorkshire, Blue John. It's in Derbyshire, but the north of Derbyshire, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. See, on the border, I can get away with that one. Anyway, Anne, thanks for that contribution. However, <laughs> um, the one thing, the one thing that, that we do find is that these images, what they do, the, the brown areas actually show that the brown areas of the clay, right? And what you can clearly see is that these flecks here are probably these these white ones are probably limestone flecks like limestone granules right but the rest of this indicates the grit stone this is all the grit stone and what's happened is as they're collecting the clay the, the clay has got these these fine minute grains in them mm. of of the surrounding grit stone now i know i know several archaeologists one's called a uh, uh, Blinkhorn. Um, he was one of those guys that used to do a lot of stuff with Time Team. He used to be their, their, one of their prehistoric Roman experts. But a good friend of mine now who's, who's really, really ill and, um, you know, he's, he's uh, which is a bit of a shame, Stephen Clark. Um, he's their medieval expert. He used to be the medieval expert for Time Team. And he could, he could look at pottery under, un, under his lens and he could tell you exactly where that pottery originated. Yeah. Right. And these are all samples or cross sections of pottery across Derbyshire and again this indicates that we've got settlements we've got people using various different types of clay clay from riverbeds and so on obviously what we're talking about is is we've got I've got, I've got to be very very careful when I'm talking about clay clay is usually associated with the limestone landscapes right but what you can get is boulder clays and other sedimentary clays which overlie grit stone landscapes and in fact when when um when i've been using when we've been using clay um to to do the daub here on the outside of the building we've had to go to the coast where where it's just it's just basically a grit stony type shale like landscape however there's boulder clay and that boulder clay is perf perfect for um making pottery out of and in many ways this is sort of giving you an idea so Pottery itself, indicator of people living and, and being active within this landscape. Um, so I, I what we're going to do next, we're going to look at this. Right. So what I've got to do now, I, I, I'm painfully aware that I've um, some of the solar panels on the roof have come off. And they're, and they're tapping against the window. So I, I've got to uh, um, I've got to make sure that that doesn't smash through and uh, cause me an injury, but we're okay for now. Right, so the next, next thing I want us to do is I want to get straight down to the undies. Uh, not yours, Goff, because I know you're not wearing any, but I want to get straight down to our undies and I want us to look at Barrow Diggers Part 8. Right, and um, this cap, the caption for this speaks for it as it's all. Now, I found when we were doing Barrow Diggers last night, it was a, it was extremely laborious. Um, and the problem was there, there was a lot of content. Um, and what so what I'm going to try to do in our session tonight is I'm going to try and paraphrase lots of it. However, Barrow Diggers. Now, we know some Barrow Diggers were right numpties and other Barrow Diggers were good. Right. Um, and what we've got, we've got Bateman, who was one of the barrow diggers that we were looking at, who died in 1861, which will feature a great deal tonight. Right. Bateman died in 1861. Mm. He was one of those barrow diggers dar digging in Derbyshire. Um, and he had his lieutenants. If you remember a certain Rourke, who was a bit of a cowboy. Uh, he was he was excavating as one of um, a, as one of Bateman's lieutenants. But. If we want to think of good diggers like um, Reverend Samuel Pegg, and we've got a name of a fairly good digger tonight um, that we're going to try and get to, right? Um, and we're going to look at the work of Merriweather, 
And there are one or two other people that we're going to actually look at as well, if we can actually get to them. I don't know if we will. But the caption of this, keep this in our minds. Barrow digging gained impetus during the 1840s. You would have thought it already gained impetus, digging up in Derbyshire, digging up in Cornwall after the 1860s, digging up in Kent in the um, um, 1810, 1815 type of period. Wiltshire, there's barrow diggers everywhere. Barrow diggers in Scotland, barrow diggers, uh, maybe one or two in Orkney as well. Barrow diggers, but, but what we've got, we've got barrow diggers, lots of these barrow diggers, digging going on and the caption is rather interesting there let's let's just read the caption and try and interpret it in a in a short while um yeah it but it goes to it goes um to say um driven off again and my men scattered i am tired of this i am black and blue all over with hand thumps now what is this saying right Barrow digging gained impetus, as we know, in the 1840s. And in many areas where tumuli proliferated, the barrow openers likewise increased. Now, don't get confused now. Dolman, it's, it's, it's a, a burial chamber as well. A khan, it's, it's like a stone barrow, a barrow. Uh, you've got tumuluses, which is a name. Basically, tumulus and barrow, dolmans. Um, Khans, they're basically all the same type of things, right? They're just burials for people in the um, Neolithic period, Bronze Age, maybe a bit of the Iron Age as well. The years 1840 to 1870 can, can justifiably be called the boom years. Proportions of fields were ripped open. It was a sport. The antiquarian Carrington wrote in 1851, in no age or nation have the investigations of the past from contents of the tumuli been so arduously pursued as they have been of late in this kingdom? And that's a really interesting comment. And the reason why that's a really interesting comment, because in 1807, in Denmark, for example, sites in Denmark, mounds were protected ancient monuments, right? In Britain, we didn't start protecting our ancient monuments until the 1880s. We, in Britain, are still behind the continent in protecting our history and archaeology, believe it or not. Um, if you go to Denmark, for example, today, you can be imprisoned for metal detecting instantly. If you cut down an old tree in a village, you can be in incarcerated. Mm. If the old tree has got some meaning in a village in Denmark, you can receive a prison sentence for harming that tree, right? In Britain, we can cut down trees and nobody does anything about it, right? You can cut down an ancient oak and nothing happens. In, in Denmark, you're incarcerated. Now, many of these diggings were reprehensibly carried out, more often than not in a mere scramble after relics. We think of the very adage of the scramble for Africa, don't we? In 1878, the scramble for Africa, they're out to grab bits of Africa. We've got a miniature scramble for Africa. We've got a miniature scramble for barrows in the 1840s and before and after. And we've got barrow digging, as we, we mentioned in the 1900s, and you know, it goes on. Few descriptions of the work were committed to paper. And unfortunately, this is one of the great tragedies. A mound was dug into in 1840 in Banby Moor. Now, in the 1840s, we haven't got an exact date. A certain J. Walker Ord writes in History and Antiquities of Cleveland. He writes of a barrow digging. No real detail, but barrow digging. He goes, <coughs> should I do it in a Scottish accent? There we go. Why, hey man! Oh no, that's Geordie. Earth, charcoal, and stones were oh, hi. Oh, oh, hi. Hi. Shut up, you silly woman! What's the most being Derbyshire? I don't know what a Derbyshire accent is. Oh. <laughs> let's let's do a deep Derbyshire accent. Earth, charcoal, and stones were flung up by the workmen's spades. Begins a depressing account 
and I threw a whole day digging in this fashion with dusk approaching and no fines made. The party. And basically what they said, this is what was said next by our Mr. Ord. Ord. Oh, it sounds Scottish, didn't it? A year ago. <laughs> what about to the relinquish? Ah, oh, shut up. What about to relinquish the task? in despair when a lad who was playing vigorously with his spade cried out, Damn it! Here's a bit of Carl's tin! And was on the point of aiming a final Eto Boute blow at the precious Rarick when the narrator leaped down and arrested the fatal stroke. So in other words, they'd been digging all day and suddenly a piece of pottery was found. And, and basically what happened that day was beneath that piece of pottery, uh, beneath, right, beneath the stone was an urn. Despite gathering dark, it was safely extracted. And Mr. Ord held it aloft in the delighted assemblage. You can imagine a mound like this. Here's the pot in the dark. Anyway, like a trophy, another excavation at a barrow at Salt House Heath in Norfolk. They've got diggings in Norfolk as well, amazingly enough. Norfolk in 1850. First time we mentioned Norfolk in our barrow diggings, by the way. Uh, and Mr. Balding in a mound in Norfolk found, it said, a small and broken urn of sun-baked clay. It had apparently rested somewhere near the mound's surface. But its position was not clearly ascertained, but it was not observed until after it had been thrown out by the workmen. Damn those workmen! In the same year, a certain Mr. Greyville Chesters described a novel way of dealing with a concrete mass of cremated bone found in a barrow at Ruxton Mill. Now, how do you deal with a mass of cremated bone? Well, exclaimed Gravel Chesters, with great difficulty. Aye, we separated it with repeated blows of a spade and a mattock. So in other words, they, they weren't interested. They, they, they just it. simply weren't interested in human remains. They were interested in finding what was there, right? And this is the great tragedy. This is the great horror of barrow diggers. But in fact, um, it goes on today. I'm going to say it right as I did last night when I was out trying to defend the archaeology at the five mile lane. Um, I was seeing human remains um, littering the site. I, I was finding bits of pottery littering the site and the archaeologists had missed them. They'd missed human remains. Um, and I made a complaint to the um, Institute of Field Archaeology. I didn't get anywhere because they closed ranks on me. Um, but the thing is, um, it happens today, mm. even with supposed professional archaeologists. Um, and, mm. you know, we can look at what was happening in the 1800s, but it's still going on. Look at the 1800s again. Many antiquaries began to view with growing concern the increasing destruction of the barrows in Britain in a plundering search for treasure. John Ackerman, writing in 1854, noted that in Wiltshire, no inconsiderable number had been dug into under the hands of pseudo-antiquarians. He revealed that scores of our primitive primeval, no less, tumuli have been explored in a manner so careless as to jeopardise the contents and often to reduce them to fragments. This is nothing new when we're looking at barrow digging. A certain yeah. Charles Warren in 1866, writing in his Celtic tumuli of Dorset, he's, he wrote as follows. And he was, he was looking at the Dorset, Dorset barrows and he was basically saying that Dorset barrows had suffered more than those of most counties from poor excavation. He tells us this, whilst... We look at this caption. Ah, oh, I can do a Dorset accent. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I, I, hang on a minute. 
Hang on, Anne, give me a give me a give me a throw for a Dorset accent. Hang on a minute. Um didn't we uh, have blue, a lovely time when we went blue to Dorset? Uh, there, this blue and dark. I, the requirements are in many instances the cupidity of the age, a tolerated such an obliterated spirit, the large proportion of these our time hallowed records have passed from amongst us. And this destructive interest has especially prevailed within the past few years. Go on, Anne. Look, Derbyshire, Derbyshire is, is just Derbyshire, like Manchester. So it's northern. So it's northern. It's action. northern, is there anything? Do you know, I, there was an announcer at, at uh, Crew Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you, you, know, <laughs> you know Barry Siler from... What's up? Can you remember what's Barry up? Siler from Alfie de St. Peck? Like, you know... Uh, you what's get, up? Oh, what's you know, up? <laughs> and, hang on, and can you remember the announcements at Crew Train Station? It would be... <laughs> the train is leaving for Liverpool in three minutes. I don't give a bollocks if you get the train or not. Oh, by the way, Henry wants to be let in. Richard, let Henry back in. He's not there. <laughs> what do you mean he said he's there? There's nothing coming up. Oh, he he's he's on YouTube. And stop interfering with my bloody lecture. I want to get this done tonight, for God's sake. Right. Hang on a minute. What are you I'm saying? The, hang on a minute. I'm going to put the lights on. Flip the neck. You know what, right? I better shut is he, up. Is he on yet? No. Well, I don't know where he bloody is. Anyway, I don't know where he is. He's, he's put, let me in, let me in. He, he's apparently there. Oh, God, I've got to come off the lecture now. Richard, you're a numpty. Right, okay, here we go. Richard's probably got it. Richard. He's there, Richard. It's not coming up. Richard, you ruined my life. He's there. Oh, don't worry, Richard. You... Richard, Richard, I love you, really, honestly. By the way, Richard, have you ever thought about chalking up, you know, making this black, this tush, and, and, and cutting it? And you could look like it. I, I can even get you the glasses, right? What we could do, right? We can, we can have an earlier version of Hitler. You can have these glasses, Richard. If I give you these glasses, right, you can have an early version of Hitler, right, and you'd look perfect. Right, OK, you'd have I'll to wear a wig. I'll my hair, then. Yeah, I think you should. And get the comb over. By the way, Anne's got a wig. You can use her wig. Right, hang on, we've got to get back to the lecture. I was, I was right into it then. Um, hang on, share back the screen. Richard, you ruined my life. Your solar right, okay, panel's just go. gone by our house. What's, what's gone past your house, a turkey? No, your solar panel. Uh -huh. Oh, right, that's all right. Oh, bloody hell, it's gone a long way, hasn't it? Right, OK. Blame it, Al. Right. We've got to do the brummy accent now, like, you know, when we talk like this, like, you know, we're not doing brummy, we're doing Dorset, and I wish you'd stop interfering with my bloody lectures. Right. Now, this image itself, the Victorians would have titled this sketch, The Unexpected Consequences of Opening a Barrow. A certain Peter, Peter Hutchinson wrote, would-be diggers are driven off a Devon burial mound by its infuriated inhabitants. I actually believe, this is me thinking, right? I actually believe it's people shocking people away from these, these mounds. You know, the... the the skeletons actually represent people because the people were not really happy with people digging into these mounds. They really, really weren't. weren't. And um, I've just got to put this on. They really, really weren't happy with people digging into these mounds. And here we go. Um, our friend, Charles Warren. We've got to get back to a um, Dorset accent. Did we have a lovely time? Here we go. Desecrating these time hallowed monuments for no better purpose than the indulgence of a craving inquisitiveness and the adornment of glass cases with ill understood relics 
to be pervaded, paraded for the empty admiration of those who may descend to flatter the equally vain and ignorant blatter. So in other words, there were people back in the day in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, who were actually standing saying, no, you shouldn't be digging into these mounds. No. Um, the, the first plan, if you've got to take that out, to change the MTV. This is talking in my lecture. Stop uh, being turned off. Um, oh, okay. go Stop plug, talking in my lecture. Oh, now. oh, oh for God's God. sake, please help. <laughs> I've left the old one. Oh, for God. Right, hang on. Let's just, just boot the silly bugger. Right. I can't believe this. This is trying to... I tell you what, this is entertainment value. It's what an absolute blooming numpty. I don't want to hear about your electric. Right, OK, then. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna mute the bugger now. There we go. Hang on, I've muted Richard. Oh, no. Oh, for God's sake. I'm not... Just go away. Right, there we go. I've muted him. I tell you what, you can't make this bloody up, can you? Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's... It, I tell you what, this performance each week takes a lot out of me. I, I need drugs after this. Can you send some diazepam down, Richard? I need some now. Good. Uh, uh. Actually, if, if you what, have you seen that there? These giant caves were not made by geological processes or humans. Who the hell were they made by? Aliens? Whoa. Right, okay. Big one. Back again. Uh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm struggling with this now, right? Um... Now, the one, the one thing is, is that ill-conducted pillage of idle curiosity was the words of Bateman when people were digging into these mounds. Do you only really think about it, right? They're just having a jolly on a Sunday afternoon. And this is what they were doing. They were digging. I tell you what, what we'll do, we'll go out and dig a mound. There's loads around Wick. We'll dig them all up. Do you know, Wick used to have one of the biggest concentrations alongside St. Athen of burial mounds anywhere in South Glamorgan. <laughs> Most of them were dug into. Now, the theme was becoming a heated topic by the mid-1860s, when John Mortimer, who had commenced his vast operations in East Riding of York in 1863, um, uh, to write in the reliquy... Yeah, here we go, we've got to have a Dorset accent. Hang on a minute. How, would, how do we do Yorkshire, Anne? Give me a bit. Go on. Throw me a line, Anne. Um, Yorkshire. Why, I man. Oh, no, that's from Middlesbrough, isn't it? No, sir. No, no, that's... Oh, we're doing a brummy accent. It seems a great pity that barrow diggers are not better conducted and the examination made with far greater care and labour than what we read in the newspaper details of Yorkshire diggings. He concluded, and this, this is our friend, right? The one thing as well is, right, John, John Mortimer is, is basically, um, he, he's, he's writing about, he's digging in Yorkshire in 1863. And then he, he's basically um, criticising people's work. Here we go. This is John Mortimer in a Brummy accent. Oh, by the way, we've got Elise. I've been in team meetings that sometimes require a glass of wine. Don't worry, Lise, at least you need it. Right, here we go. Let's do the Brummy accent. I speak out as an experienced authority on such matters and defy any antiquary to properly examine nearly 20 barrows within the month, although Mortimer himself once dug 10 in 13 days. As was largely expressed in the columns of the leading newspapers. I sincerely pray these remarks may, for the future, prove of service by putting a check to the speculations of the curiosity seeker and of the individual is actuated by that cursed spirit of gain, which has in late years spoiled so many of our Yorkshire tumuli. And what the hell a Brummy was doing commenting on that, I don't know. But what we're talking about, we got writers of the day who had been digging mounds, right? Who were also criticising other people for digging too many mounds and then saying that our digging is better than your digging. And no, you're not telling us about the digging that you're working on. And the, to sort of 
underline what I'm exactly talking about, right, is that what I'm talking about is that this guy Ruddock, right, Ruddock's working in Yorkshire, one of the lieutenants for Bateman, right? Ruddock digs 100 mounds in Yorkshire, right? Between 1840 and 1858, for 100 mounds that we know about, we know that he dug at least 300 plus mounds in Yorkshire that we don't know about. That is what our friend John Mortimer is talking about. He's saying that there are people digging mounds and that we don't even know where they're digging them. We don't even know what they're finding. What's going on? This needs to stop. It had stopped in Denmark decades earlier, but we're still digging our mounds in Britain, which is a great shame. Our friend Mortimer in the 1860s, he would say, perform the work well and most scientifically instead of hacking up a great number in an incredible short time. Now, people are starting to realize that it's why are they realizing that digging these mounds isn't the right thing to do? They're actually starting to realize if we go back to an earlier quote that smashing through a layer of human remains with spades and mattocks is not the right thing to do. There's another writer, Jewett, who had actually worked with Bateman, writing in the publication Reliquy. He condemned the hasty, indiscriminate and incomplete manner in which some of the Yorkshire tumuli have been opened. We're directly talking about Ruddock, who Ruddock was digging into these mounds and making no record at all. Jewett would say, called for some kind of serious rebuke from genuine antiquities, antiquaries, and from those who love the science which they have espoused. So what we're talking about, we're talking about people are really starting to question what's going on. Jewett would write also, wholesale destruction by persons of whom better things ought to be looked for or barrows in the Yorkshire walls. Notoriety and display, not science and genuine research are the objects of the explorers and ransackers and the barrows. So in other words, what they're doing, they're digging as many mounds as they can to get notoriety and display, but they weren't interested in the science. They weren't interested in those variable layers that would tell yeah. us about the history itself. An, arche an archeological, um, an archeologist's landscape, the object of which is to destroy the largest numbers of barrows in the least possible time and to bag the spoils in order that the unenviable achievement may be duly chronicled in the times was the only aim and not the science of recording the archaeology in the first place. So what we're talking about now, this image is wrong. What we're also talking about is that is wrong. What we're also talking about is making yourself popular because you're digging these mounds is also wrong. What we need to see is the archaeology dug into properly, which yes. until this point, there was a great deal of question whether people digging into mounds was the right thing to do even then. And it's still a question that we're talking about today. Should we continue to be digging into the past when we can't really understand and process the past that we've got around us? For example, have anyone seen the report made of the Roman corn drying kilns found at the Aston Martin plant? No, I haven't, but I went on site, filmed it and nearly got arrested for making a film and put it on YouTube. And that's the only footage of these corn drying kilns found very recently, not 200 years ago. In fact, the other thing about this is that we've got all this work being done and nobody knows anything about it even today, let alone back then. Nothing's changed. Archaeology in Britain is in an absolute shambles back then and it is today. Jewett added, it is not the number of barrows which can be opened done 
as the common galloping tourists expression is in a season. Genuine archaeologists know no seasons and no campaigns, but the scrupulous, careful examination of a few when circumstances are favorable and time can be devoted that bestowed a lasting benefit on prehistory and prehistorians. And this is what they were saying. I think somebody's trying to come on, one of you. Uh, this is what people were trying to say in the 1850s and the 1860s. And that's exactly what we're saying today. When anyone comes to me today and says, isn't that wonderful that they dug over there? I usually say, nope. Oh, that's terrible. It's not. We, we can't really examine what we've got. There are museums out there that are full of artifacts that have never, ever been seen. In fact, there are boxes in museums and nobody knows what's in those boxes because the contents were not even published. It would have been pleasant to report that the growing awareness of wholesale barrow, barrow mutilation and destruction was arrested by the protest of the enlightened. But unfortunately, bad excavation was not a prerogative solely of the 1800s. It is an evil that has endured well into the present century and now. Coupled with the careless obliteration wrought by modern agriculture and the expansion of industry and building programs, it has led to the eradication of a vast number of burial mound destruction that could ill be afforded. And I quote St. Athen a few years ago when they were putting the housing estate up, loads of burials underneath a landscape that once had mounds. We've already had this conversation, but that is a landscape that the mounds were once there removed and they were looking at the burials in St. Af Athen really, really recently. And all the archeology span found between Cowbridge and Lanfrenach that we don't know what was found at all in an aim to build housing estates for people to buy houses that cost a million pounds and they're struggling to sell them. Wholesale destruction of archeology span because we want to build houses that nobody actually wants. Oh, Carl. Yeah, go for it. Anne has disappeared, so I don't know. Hang on a minute. There's nothing coming up on my... What I'm gonna do, Richard, I'm gonna stop this a moment. And... Yeah, you 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 are you you are um I'm gonna make you co-host again. I think what may have happened, Richard, I think you went off and you went back on, so you may have lost your co-host. So if you if you could look out for Anne, that'd be great. I'm glad you told yeah. me. Um it is all it's all the strange stuff that is happening today. Um the, the problem is Henry's got no clothes now because all his clothes were blown away in the storm. <laughs> Isn't that right, Henry? <laughs> right, okay, back again, good. Anyway, I've got a massive load of images tonight, but what we're gonna do, there's Merriweather. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna gently bring this image into play. There's nothing wrong with a set of skeletal remains. This is what we want to be able to see. Even, even if we, we look at this and we think that that looks, you know, a bit exaggerated, at least people are recording things. And it's important that even though you might exaggerate what you're seeing and what you're presenting, it's still a record of sorts. This is William, William, William Cunnington on Roundway Hill in 1855. Anne's just tried to get on, Richard. And the skeleton poses peacefully, wearing a satisfied smile. Often such deposits are damaged by the weight of the super incumbent earth or stones and are rarely found in such a perfect state. But again, it's, it's a representation that we've got within archeology span that helps us understand the past. It's better having this than no record at all. Wiltshire, from about the time Thomas Bateman, we've, we've moved from the north, but we're going to co go back and forth, right? From, the, from about the time Thomas Bateman was beginning his operations in the 1840s in Derbyshire, Barrow Diggin was being vigorously per persecuted in a number of other English counties. 
and in Welsh counties, Scottish counties and uh, Cornwall. Workers of varying degrees of skill and competence were carrying out programmes of Barrow research in Wiltshire, Dorset, Yorkshire, elsewhere. Since an attempt to list all the busy enthusiasts and assess um, and examine their work would take a vast amount of space. We're talking about we're talking about a list of antiquaries digging. There are antiquaries who dug, and we don't even know who they were. Um, so we we you know in a way we're critical of these antiquaries digging and not giving us a record. But at least we know they dug somewhere. There are people who are digging. We don't even know where they dug. We don't even know their names. So that's even worse. One of the most notorious of the diggers of Wiltshire is a chap by the name of Dean John Merriweather of Hart, um, Hartford. No, not Hartford, Hereford, right? Um, and this is, in fact, Merriweather. And this is going to surprise you. Merriweather is one of those oddments. He's bad for archaeology, but then again, he gave us some kind of a record. Merriweather, Dean Merriweather, was, was a frustrated clergyman, as most are. And he lived 53 years. Now, there was a question asked yesterday, right, um, along the lines of, these barrow diggers, could they have caught diseases from the barrows that they were digging? And I suddenly started to realise that when we're looking at barrow diggers, for example, Bateman, Bateman only lived 40 years. He extensively excavated in Derbyshire. Merriweather lived 53 years and excavated for only 28 days in Wiltshire. And interestingly enough, one year after he'd, he'd been digging, he was dead. It's mm -hmm. funny that mm -hmm. I, I, I haven't actually I haven't accept, um, um, looked at what I'm trying to uh, what I'm trying to understand here, but there might be a direct link to, to these barrow diggers and their untimely deaths. Merriweather, there he is. Between the 18th of July and the 14th of August, 18, 1849 which at the same time there was cholera and typhus out outbreaks due to people digging train lines through previous cholera and plague pits in London and elsewhere in Liverpool and so on. Uh, this guy in, on the Marlborough Downs in Wiltshire dug 35 barrows that we know about. So in other words, that means that he dug more than one barrow a day. And one of these barrows was actually... Silbury Hill and, and you're thinking hang on a minute hang on a minute Carl right this is not a barrow this is a mound right mm -hmm. he even dug this this is one of his diggings in 28 days in July August 1849 and he also dug into West Kennet Long Barrow so he's, he excavated some of the most famous sites in 28 days it was almost his, his grand tour a year before he died. This concentrated um, despoiling, that's a nice word, despoiling of the landscape, was written up by Merriweather. Unfortunately, it was posthumously printed in a small book known as The Diary of a Dean, 1851. Any single one of those sites that he excavated would have been a book. He excavated 35 of them. The publication shows him to be an enthusiastic barrow digger who, like others of his ilk, oh. derived great pleasure from his researches. He dedicated the book as a legacy to my native county, whose antiquaries I, be I began in early life to study. The interesting thing about Merriweather is that he was a frustrated clergyman and he went on a bender um, digging these sites at the end of his clergyman career. And he'd actually, he'd actually probably been digging very early on at the time of Cole Hall 
in the early 1800s. In other words, when he was like 15, 16 or whatever, he was digging these mounds. The dean it's himself was, was fascinated by these monuments. And one of the deans, Dean Merriweather's most ambitious schemes was actually digging a hole into Silbury Hill. But he didn't supervise the digging. That's how he was able to dig so many mounds. He basically said, right, you guys dig over there. I'll be back next week. You guys dig over there. And I want you guys, Anne, right? You're, you're, the, you're the foreman, Anne, right? I want you to dig into that mound and, and stop when you get to the middle. Those were the instructions. Mm. And stop when you get to the middle, right, Anne? All right. Make sure you do, right? And in fact, that's a photograph taken quite some years later. In, in fact, that's a photograph of his diggings into the chalk mound. And what, we, what we've got here is basically um, the Archaeological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland caused this tunnel to be excavated in AD 1849. A shaft from the summit to the base had been sunk about 75 years previously by other parties. On neither occasion was anything discovered indicative of the purpose for which the hill was raised. And the other time it was dug was from the top of the mound um, all the way to the centre of the mound in 1877 mm. by Cornish tin miners who were employed to do the work under the guidance of the Duke of Northumberland and a Colonel Drax. Nothing was found then. Nothing was found mm. by the likes of Merriweather, except in 1777, when we say nothing was found, um, it, um, they found some, some wood they believed to be in the course of their shaft that they had dug down. These, these were Cornish diggers. And they believe that that, that that wood that they found may have actually been related to some kind of coffin. But we don't know. Um, Merriweather, Merriweather's workmen dug into the side of the mound, right? Um, and there it is, not from not um, not vertically, but horizontally. Mm -hmm. And here we go. Here we go. It could hardly be expected that these two small openings would be likely to find the primary grave under Silbury Hill. The two rat holes would be likely to come upon the ashes of a mouse placed under a mound ten feet in diameter. Merriweather was not present when this when this hole was dug. He told his workmen to dig towards the middle of the mound. Um, unfortunately, the workmen went through the middle of the mound and continued seven feet further. So in other words, if they had found anything, they destroyed it in doing so. Matters were complicated. And because nothing was found, they decided to stop the work. And in fact, this was this was uh, rediscovered in 1969 with the BBC sponsored excavation of the mound. Mm -hmm. And they found Merriweather's tunnel, but Merriweather's tunnel had been sealed since the end of the First World War. Mm -hmm. But when they did refind it in 1969, they found the plaque, this little plaque in the tunnel saying, that somebody had actually been there. Yeah. The work of Merriweather was to basically have unsupervised labour gangs, and those labour gangs would basically work laboriously until they found something. But if they didn't know what they were looking for, it was absolutely pointless. So this is why, this is how, by hook or by crook, Merriweather was able to excavate 35 mounds in the space of 28 days, which, which, was, a, which was a massive shame. It said also, uh, this, is a, this, is, this is a tragedy as well. Um, Merriweather um, had dug into a mound which was near uh, Avery called Mill Barrow. 
and he and basically completely destroyed it. In other words, the damage that these people were doing uh, was un, was untenable. It was just it it it, it was horrific hugely horrific going back to the image of Merriweather there he is again Merriweather rarely did Merriweather told us that he dug 35 mounds but he may have dug a hundred more over his lifetime we've got no record of where he dug Merriweather's record detail um, was ine inevitably poor the, he basically found a Roman coin hoard near the surface of a barrow. He basically said, greatly excited the interest of the bystanders of the labouring class who had on many occasions shown a disposition to watch our proceedings. Under the impression which in all quarters possessed them, to my cost, I know it. In some cases, to the destruction of antiquarian treasure, that such excavations are made for the purpose of finding money. So, there was, what's what's being said is that um, Merriweather's saying, "I'm digging," and and you know, the tourists are causing problems, but he is the problem anyway. He is the problem. If he wasn't digging there in the first place, tourists wouldn't be there causing other damage. It's said, thankfully that the work of Merriweather ended after the digging of Silbury Hill. And his work ended on the 14th of August, 1849, in a storm similar to the one we're having today. On the final excavation, going back, this is where this image makes sense. As a final a finale to the last excavation, the 35th excavation of those 28 days, the night following work in unfavorable weather, a dramatic thunderstorm set the seal on Merriweather's Wiltshire um, excursion. This event was much to the sat satisfaction of the rustics whose notions respecting the excavation of Silbury and the opening of the barrows were not divested of superstition dread. Superstition, there we go, you can see that in the image. It must have been a spectacular affair. So in other words, there was a massive thunderstorm on the last day of his excavation, feeling the end of his excavations. Mary the Weather described it as, one of the most grand and tremendous thunderstorms I ever re recollect to have witnessed. It made the hills re-echo to the crashing pearls and Silbury itself, as the men asserted who were working in its centre to tremble to its base. So in other words, it's likely that his men was, was still trying to dig into this mound, right, at that moment. And Merriweather's work ceased, and he died in 1850. Aww. His work was not published in his lifetime. It was, it was published in 1851. His work left much to be desired. And its failures include the ever uh, recurrent one of, of not positively identifying clearly most of this, the sites they work on. So basically, and he worked over there, you know, the bit over there, you know, you can see yeah. over there, he worked there. And he also worked over there as well, um, down down the hill and down the valley, he worked over there as well. You know, mm -hmm. that one, that, that, yeah, he worked there. In other words, we don't know where he exactly worked, no. except we, we know he worked in Silbury Hill. Um, it's it's you know is visitation it's a good called... story though makes, it's a good makes story a good, a good story yeah but yeah. To the damage of the landscape yeah now but of course that's that that must have been the start of you know getting ethics and you know rules and regulations and you know and, and this is this is the thing people were wanting to publish what was there but one of the problem is they, they were only publishing part of the record. Lots of the antiquarian diggers weren't interested in lots of things, but no. there were some that were. Mm. There were some that were. Now, known, known to a chap by the name of John Ackerman, who lived between 1806 and 1873, 
though not the prolific excavator, made some pertinent comments on the downland barrows in 1854, four years after the death of Merriweather. Worth reprinting for his wry pessimism regarding the likelihood of those producing any worthwhile finds. So this is what he wrote, and there's, there's some bearing in what he's telling us. Ackerman. Here we go. Let's have a Dorset action. Experiences taught me not to anticipate great things from excavations. I had learned long ago that a rude and crumbling urn or a simple heap of ashes and calcinine bones were the frequent result of a whole day's digging in these early sepulchre mounds. Besides a possibility of our working long in one which had been explored by some previous investigator, more intent in the acquisition of treasure than a procuring of antiquarian relics. So in other words, he's being critical there at the same time, but he's also telling us that digging into mounds is not what it's meant to, is not what it's set up to be. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's saying that, you know, um, calcinine bones, that's basically cremated bones, that's what that means. Uh, he's talking about um, sepulchre mounds, ligand, sepulchre mounds, the barrow, barrows, that's what he's talking about. Um, it's not what it's, what it's set up to be. And there's disappointment. But what you are finding is of value because you're telling us about it. Nevertheless, he was persuaded that such excavations were not, although, or altogether profitless. Read that again. Persuaded that such excavations were not altogether profitless. Incidentally, the year following Ackerman's tedious, irksome and laborious operations, William Cunnington um, was was busy re-excavating barrows on Roundway Hill, previously dug by his more famous great uncle. Cunnington dug into seven barrows in the area of Wiltshire, producing a somewhat idealized illustration of a beaker burial found in one of the mounds. And obviously something like this. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the, the, the one thing that we can say is that it, this is this is what this is um, this is one of the much idealized representations of a beak burial by William Cunnington on Roundway Hill in 1855. Now, although William Cunnington is undoubtedly stylizing what he's finding, he's actually showing us. Um, the remains. Mm. He's telling us where the remains are at Roundway Hill. He's 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 making an illustration, and this is if this is if all the antiquarians had done this, it, it would have been great. But they didn't. Mm. You can criticise this for being stylized, but it's still telling us that something's found there, yeah. a crouched burial, and that needs to be commended. And appreciated for what it is and not for what it was. Yeah. Now, when we're talking about Wiltshire again, there's another chap by the name of Reverend Lucas, um, another chap who, who, who lived in the 1800s, 1878, 1892. Lucas was also digging on Wiltshire Mounds, a place known as Cow Down. Um, and now he was a, he had basically um, been in Europe, but he originated from Guernsey and his family were a family of excavators. His dad, Frederick Lucas, had worked on Guernsey opening chambered tombs and his dad had inspired his son, Reverend William Collis Lucas, to go out digging in Wiltshire. Lucas realized and urged the importance. This is an interesting, we, we've got to do this right. 1855, 1861. Lucas realized 
and urge the importance of recording the fine spots of everything found within the landscape. Every prehistoric artifact, bronze, stone implements, and the value of sketching them. Perhaps one thing that he gave us was correlation maps of the archeology span that he was finding. And, and we're not talking about what he was finding in barrows. We're talking about that ax head that was found in a plowed field and that piece of prehistoric pottery that was found over there with no relation to mounds. Yeah. This is what he felt archeology span was about. And that's what we're doing today. Mm. This is archeology span today. He yeah. was correlating and plotting the archeology span across the land mm. that he was looking at. And this was inspired by the work of his dad. His observations on the burials found in megalithic tombs were very much in advance of their time, in that he was given us a picture of everything that was being found. And that's very important. One, we've got other people doing this, right? But we've got this man suddenly, Lucas, L U I K I S, giving us a picture of the landscape of archeology span and not the individual sites that everybody else had seemed to be excavating up until that point. Now this is Lucas, right? Between 1842 and maybe a little after 1864, dug 26 mounds. That was in 22 years. So in other words, that's just about a mound a year. Yeah. which is actually pretty good going. Yeah. He obviously took his time. When in fact, if you want to do a comparison, again, Merriweather dug 35 mounds in 28 weeks. It's 28 days, 28 days, 35 mm -hmm. mounds in 28 days. Lucas hadn't even dug one mound in 28 days. No. And he certainly didn't dig. 35 mounds in his time excavating in, tw in 22 years. He dug 26. Lucas was a man of his age telling us that we need to take time. Lucas was explored in the world of archaeology. He understood archaeology, understood how archaeology worked. This is not Champollion working in ancient Egypt at the beginning of the 1800s. This is at not Baltista Belzoni working in Egypt in 1861, wishing to explore and understand the world of archaeology. This is Lucas using the external world of archaeology to help us understand how archaeology should be placed within its understanding and within some sense of a meaning and within a genre that should be archaeology being important to people and to be understood within the landscape of the world that archaeology is. Archaeology is a world, not just individuality, and looking for treasure. Lucas had noted as early as 1837, even before Bateman was digging, the presence of parts of bodies and accumulations of bones in the tombs of Guernsey, I felt that the burial of these part bodies was some sort of a rite. His ideas foreshadowed modern interpretations of temporary pre-burials of bodies at special mortuary sites. He wrote somewhat pertinently to Thomas Bateman, saying something about these bones. And this is revolutionary. Let's do Lucas in a very respectful, learned voice. I am informed that in China, the body is buried temporarily. And when denuded of flesh, the bones are taken up and carried to the tomb with great pomp. If such was custom during the stone period, much of our observations will have their full explanation. And in a moment, He's revolutionized archaeology. He's saying what those bones are. They're bones that have moved from one place to another and give some meaning to the random bones that Bateman had been finding. I gotta be honest with you, Bateman didn't give a 
damn buggery, really, about some of the bones he was finding. But Lucas did. But I don't think that's fair on Bateman either. Because Bateman did make records at the same time. Lucas also noted, the discovery of parts only of skeletons within kists is worthy of examination, perhaps too often attributed to past disturbance. So what Lucas is telling us is that you've got to observe and have stance and slants on the burial customs and traditions. He was a far-sighted thinker. Many of his ideas had elements of truth in them that only became evident much later in the minds of much, much more unmaligned archaeologists and the modern day and age. Lucas was a revolutionary and is a name that no doubt none of us have come across. Lucas. Not L U K A S. L U L U K I S. Oh. L U K I S. Lucas. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, Lucas had been within a family of diggers, and it's got to be remembered that those family of diggers um, were, were digging in Brittany, Guernsey, Derbyshire, Anglesey, and Ireland. For the first time, barrow digging in Ireland, great. And he was excavating um, in Buxton, Derbyshire, in 1865. Lucas wrote to his father, I indeed felt truly happy in again following that pursuit which you have taught us almost from our cradle to take delight in. In other words, he also had a brother called William. So they 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 they, they both dug, you know, they, they were very much into the archaeology. And did you did you remember I mentioned Cow Down earlier on in Derbyshire? I said this is where Cow Down is. Derbyshire yeah. again. Yeah. Lucas report a cow down contains a good plan of the Barrow Cemetery. It wasn't a scale, but what he did, he basically said, we've got that there. There's a tree over there. There's a rock there. There's a that there. There's that there. There's that there. He did a map. It wasn't the best map in the world, but he showed us a map of, of the moments within the landscape, which could be equally found today at Cow Down. There are also stylized plans of some barrows and a few sections plus sketches of the main finds. He dug 17 barrows in the group. 17 barrows within only the 26 barrows that he excavated in his lifetime. And then finally, he goes to write in Yorkshire and Wiltshire archeological journals. And he's very harsh of the work of Colt Hall in the early part of the 1800s. Now he can say that the pioneering work of the early people was not the greatest. Lucas said, although admitting Hall's praiseworthy aim, Lucas accused Cole Hall, an early digger, of unwittingly the following. Doing as much as any man could to prevent archaeologists from knowing to the full extent what his vast researches and extensive experience should have taught him respecting Wiltshire Barrows and to mislead barrow diggers of later day. He deplored the loss of information relating to the construction of barrows, which was not recorded by Colt Hall. In other words, he was saying, that now we've got to record everything. We've got to take time. And he was taking time. If he's digging one barrel a year and Cole Hall's digging 50, you can see the difference in ethics. Even, even, even if Lucas spent a week digging one single mound, that was revolutionary because other barrel diggers may have dug 20 in the same time. As you remember, there was one barrow digger, he, 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 dug, um, he, he dug a dozen, 20 mounds in a day, you know. So Lucas was by far the man 
of understanding the importance of taking time and making a record. How many, Lucas also said, how many articles of antiquary of great value have been overlooked and lost through the mode in which he prosecuted his researches. If he himself had handled the spade or been continually present with his laborers, we should have not now have to lament the unscientific opening of innumerable barrows. He also talks about Merriweather not being present when the bloody excavations were taking place so that we could have some data of the archaeology that was lost. Lucas recalled that had he followed Hoare's method in digging, the Collingborough group of mounds that he had early excavated, the work would have been an enigma and nothing found. Lucas strictures on cold whores excavations were that he had a way of excavating that was very different than previous diggers. Cole Hall, um, Lucas had recognized some of the value of early excavations, but he had a new way of excavating and the Lucas method of excavating archaeological sites is sometimes used today to excavate barrows. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Lucas, in many cases, we have difficulty in ascertaining the material of their construction. The site of the internment within the barrow is frequently only implied instead of being accurately noted. We are led to the conclusion that the chief, if not sole object in the investigation, was the possession of the articles which had been deposited with the dead. Lucas returned to the theme rather unfairly in an article in some barrow diggings in the Yorkshire Archaeological Journal for 1871. Lucas's usual modus operandi was to drive a trench into a selected barrow, usually from the south side. And we've got to put my little scribble on the screen now. So let's scribble some stuff on the screen. Let's do that. Um, scribbling on the screen, scribbling on the screen. Let's go scribble on the screen. Um, share the whiteboard. And here we go. Now his excavation method is, if we can be very crude. Oh no, that's that doesn't look like a mound. <laughs> right, okay. Let, let's just try and draw a mound, right? A circular mound. That'll do. Um, and his excavation method was to, as in his own words, we dug a wide trench from the south point to the center. So this is what they would do. So let, let's 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 do this, right? Um, he would do this. Maybe that's a bit wide. However, the excavation of Cole Hall, what the way Cole Hall would excavate, he would just do this. Right. And unfortunately, when Cole, the yellow is Cole Hall, when, when Cole Hall is digging, um, if he's not found anything, he basically examined, he, 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 he abandoned the excavation. Right. But what Lucas would do, and next we carry trenches east and west from the south side at a few feet from the base of the mound. So, in other words, what we would do, he would then leave. And he was actually criticized for this, but he's, he's not far out. This is how he might do his excavation. So a trench on the east and, and the west. So we'd excavate. So basically what that means is you've got bits of the mound still left. 
this is the way he dug. And he felt that digging, leaving bits of the mound would mean that future generations would be able to dig the mound to either prove or disprove his results. But mm -hmm. there'd be some material for other generations to, to excavate. And these later trenches curved to, to basically to follow the shape of the barrow. The trench system outlined above revealed the primary burial if it was in the center. And if it hadn't, it would find the burial elsewhere. And in his own words, brought to light a series of internments in positions where they have not been commonly observed in Wiltshire. So in other words, he devised an excavation technique that he could actually find the archeology span which Cole Hall had completely missed. And that is actually a modern, that is actually, this is how we excavate some mounds today. Slightly different, but what we do, we, we do quadrant excavations. We, we, or we might do a trench like this, but we wouldn't dig a trench directly through. We, we don't do that anymore. We don't dig like trench all the way through. We leave part of the trench like he did, a full section. Even if his diagrammatic plans, um, if accurate, would show areas of the mound untouched. People would criticize this, but it, it, but it was pointless criticizing his excavation method because his excavation method was quite sound. Now, I'm very wary of time now, and we're not gonna take a break. I'm gonna keep talking through, and we're gonna go until 20 past, and then that, that'll be it. So I'm gonna see what I can get through now. Um, and, and what I might do, is is mention this bit here where I got to last night and then we'll do the other bits that that I um that we did last night some of the bits that we did last night right so if we if we come off this um and we go there um and we do that and we try and get some of the images not many images tonight, I know. But there we go. So there we go. And this is this is basically these are some of Merryweather sketches. They're, 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 they're missing lots of what 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 sketches Merryweather actually did do. But again, we're, we're sort of looking back again and getting an idea of of this and, and back to where we were. Having this as a backdrop, this is, again, completely different from the way Lucas would have dug. Lucas' father had written to Bateman in August 1855. This is Lucas's father, the other sort of antiquarian in the family, giving details of his son's activities at Cow Down in Derbyshire, which we know where that is. And it goes, it goes as follows. As for those that don't know where Cow Down is, Cow Down is um, which one? Cow Down. Hang on, I just gonna remember. Cow Down is at the bottom of the screen, isn't it? Oh, hang on, look. Cow Down. Which one's Cow Down again? Cow Down is. Um, but the Cow Down is number two. So there, there's where he's excavating cow down number two, slightly above Buxton. So cow down, this is where we are. So if we go back to sort of, um, again, this is not the way he was excavating. This is the way Bateman may have excavated. And this is the way Cole Hall would have excavated. But this is Luke, Lucas's dad writing about Lucas's excavations at cow down. He, Lucas, my son, is in the middle of Sir Richard Cohor's scene of labours and having free leave to explore over the estates around him. He has commenced his diggings recently. He has explored eight barrows, which must have escaped the barrows, the, the baron's vigilance. So in other words, he's basically critical of Cohor, the baron's vigilance. Eight barrows missed. His work is chiefly devoted to the surrounding low barrows. Many of these can only be discerned by the eye of the practical digger, 
and he leaves these elevated mounds to future examinations. So in other words, that's great. So he's saying that there's value in leaving some mounds, not excavating everything. The usual position of the skeleton found is that of lying on one side bent up at the legs. And we've already seen that, haven't we? This is one of Cunnington, Cunning, Cunnington's illustrations. Actually, 1855. Uh, at the same time that we're talking about this. Here we go. Again, repeating this bit. Lying on one side bent up at the leg. With one vase near the head. Well, the vase at this one's actually at the feet. Singularly enough that many of these subjects are not 12 inches below the grass of the plain and yet preserved in per nearly perfect states. So in other words, the mounds above them have eroded away. So he, he's digging in these mounds that were missed by Cole Hall and actually coming up with some good results. Lucas was a careful observer. He noted that some of the barrows uh, in, in the cow down group had been in, enlarged to accommodate, accommodate subsequent burials. So in other words, in a moment, he's saying that there's more going on. So you've got the primary burial and you've got burial around it. More's added. He usually described the materials of the mound, but did not always give details of their size. OK. Everyone, everyone can make mistakes. And a numer enumeration of one burial deposit will serve to show his orderly method and concise description. He was great at descriptions and looking at layers. So whether he got size is completely right, but we got the detail. It refers to a primary interment found in a barrow, a kist, very similar to this illustration of Merriweather when Merriweather actually did do illustrations. This chalk cut grave was three foot, 10 inches long, 15 inches wide and one foot deep. It was almost nine foot from the apex of the mound. And when we, when we think about, when we think about descriptions, given by Lucas, close your eyes. And this is a description that he gives about one of his findings, not this one. So if you close your eyes and think about the, the detail, which is missing from all the other, or most of the other figures, here we go. Let's get Lucas's voice. The grave was cylindrical and had been lined with a plaster of powdered chalk about one and a half inch in thickness. The plaster had received the impression of the bark of a tree and indicated that the bones of the deceased had been placed in a hollow trunk, which was deposited in the grave whilst the plaster was still moist. It was found that the coffin was only partially beneath the surface level and that it had been covered over with a similar coating of powdered chalk, which when it dried, retained an art form over the grave after the wood had decayed with the bones which had calcined, which is burnt bone, and those of a young person was a horn hammer or mace head about four inches long and one and a half inch wide. And from that, we can get a description of the area, um, what the burial was made out of, um, the cremation, an idea of the size, um, the hollowed trunk, um, the, 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 the chalk. And it gives a really good description that Lucas actually gave us about one of the mounds that he dug. Now there's some hope from that moment. That's what we're saying about barrow diggers this week. So I've got 20 minutes now and I would like to just look at something else, another question that was asked. So if I get my other piece here, um, oh my God, a certain vegan is actually sending me stuff to do. That's for next week, Mr. Began. Right. Vegan so, Tom. 
Pinkin hasn't gone. <laughs> Pinkin's still there. Oh. Henry Pinkin. Right, so here we go. The other week I was asked about Rudston, right? And, and you know, we did Rudston a few weeks ago and I thought, well, maybe what I wanted to do is just, Rudston is that site uh, up in the northeast with that wonderful um, standing stone in a church graveyard. Um, and, you know, it, it was like question, can we do a little bit more about this? And I might do a whole lecture, but I wanted to give you a little bit more about Rudston. And that stone, that really tall stone alongside the church, more or less. Rudston has evidence of continuous um, habitation for millennia and is thought to be the oldest continuously inhabited village in England. There are square and round burrows with numerous Neolithic and Bronze Age burials. Unfortunately, many of the excavations were carried out, out in the 1800s and due to the methods of archaeology, use little uh, in the way of recording these remains, which is a bit of a shame. The landscape of Rud Rudston is massively important. Um, and there's dikes, there's, there's four cursus monuments, there's work that's gone on in the 1970s. There's the Neolithic landscape of Rudston, this massive stone, the monolith itself. English heritage within the Rudston area alone have currently offered us a large plethora of evidence. And the one wonderful thing as well is when English heritage have studied the four cursus monuments at Rudston, right? It's now joining 150 identifiable cursus monuments in Britain. If you read ancient Britain, it mentioned that's obviously a bit dated now. In ancient Britain, it only discusses 20 cursus monuments. Now we've got 150 across Britain. This is over about three decades. Initially, initial thoughts are that the cursus monuments, which we have studied, those are those uh, cursus monuments, if you can remember, are those, um, are those um, a continuous bank, parallel banks that, that join each other with a terminus either end. And there's no way into them. It's basically a ditch, a bank, and it's an endless bank like a sausage. Um, and those are cursus monuments. And now that what they're thinking about the cursus monuments are as follows, uh, that they were designed as monuments that might actually be some kind of passage May, may act or might actually be a processional route. Um, um, and, you know, initial thoughts are that they were um, designed to include um, going across large tracts of landscape to control the natural world. Different th thoughts about Cursus monuments and what they may or what they might not be. Within the Redstone landscape, what they have found is the remains of a Roman villa, complete with a nine foot by four foot mosaic floor with one inch square tessera, which have been found. And this is actually at the Hull and East Riding Museum in Hull today. A lot of Roman archeology span has been found across this wonderful landscape at Redston. We might actually come back to Redstone, but I'm not sure. Another question that was asked was what we did the other week. We, we actually looked at um, Bellus Nap. Um, and somebody asked the question, what are these false doors? And, and I basically went on the search for other false doors at Neolithic sites. Now, uh, the site of Bellus Nap is, in fact, dating back over 6,000 years. And one, one, thing, one thing you can think about this is, is that this is, this is rather interesting because the false doors lead nowhere. And in fact, in front, it's almost like a bull's horn. You've got a, a courtyard in front there and it comes out on the left and the right and it leads you towards what that is. So you've got the dry stone construction um, and that, that the, the capstone there has been actually added, but the rest of it is sort of contemporary. And maybe that's been filled in, filled in as well. 
So what you've got, you've got two big stones either side, which are known as portal stones. Um, and that draws you to a false door. That's uh, the stone in between them is known as a blocking stone. Um, possibly this is an entrance to where spirits pass through. And the forecourt between this are known as the flanking, which may have actually hosted bodies, which would have sat in front of this false door. Um, and this is fascinating. And I started looking, started looking at this. Um, and I'm still the, my jury's out on if there's any false doors like this left in Britain. And one point that one one other point that I made um, that I didn't make when we looked at Bella Snap the other day was if we actually go to um, hang on if we go to Google and we type in Bella Snap. And I don't know if somebody else has left or they want to come on. But if somebody could get that, please do. Um, there we go. There's Bella's nap. And can one of you see how many people are actually online? Somebody's trying to get on. No, they're not. Um, I don't know what. So there's, there's a bleeping. Hang on a minute. Yeah. I'm going to see what's happening. Oh, no, there is nobody. Ooh. Back to where I was. You are right, Anne, as usual. I, I'm using my mobile phone. Oh, it's you, it is. Is it? Yeah, you've ruined my life, Anne. Oh, sorry. Oh, the, you know, I was trying to make a point there, and you ruined it. Oh, are you saying something? about Bella Snap. There we go, Bella Snap. Now, when you think about it, the area, that's a massive long barrow, but a small number of burial chambers, right? And the point to be made is that if you look at the, look at a plan of Bella Snap, hang on, see more. It should come up, where's this plan? You can see that only one tenth of the area of Bella Snap is actually taken up with burial chambers. So why have you got such a massive mound that is demonstrated at Bella Snap? And, and the, the simple answer is actually quite clear. The mound itself is actually for the ancestors and you actually enter via the false door on the left there. This is a mound of the ancestors, not a mound of the dead, because the mound of the dead only covers one tenth of the burial chambers or the chambers where people were eventually placed to bury. Whether they were burial chambers in the first instance or not is something else. So that's my little bit about Bella Snap. And the other thing I wanted to give us this week, right, that if I can get onto it, if I can get back to my images, And there it is. And then we read some of the emails that um, Henry has sent me over the past couple of weeks. Right. One particular site from Ireland that I want to mention. And there's a point to be made with it. So we've got to do that before we finish today. But this is rather interesting. This was mentioned last week. This is from Neolithic China. And if I can remember where I've put this on my phone. And looks like a chopping board. <laughs> yeah, this is this this is um well it's not actually. No. To give you an idea of scale, right? I think this is in I think I think that's in that's um that's hang on, is it showing scale? There you go, two centimeters. Oh. I think that's the scale. So at the bottom, so if you go, it's like, um, is it eight centimeters across? I think. Anyway, if we go, that's the re that's the reconstruction, and that's the actual one there. Mm. It actually reminds me of the Sande um, whalebone tablet, the Viking one. 
mm. uh, which is which is by about a foot foot wide. That's what this reminds me of. But this is this is this is actually um, from China. This is a Neolithic ritual axe that was revealed to the public on the fifth of April, two thousand and twenty-three. Oh. So here we go. This is new as it is. This is Neolithic China. Now, <clears throat> one of the only languages that I can actually pronounce the words for is actually Chinese. So here we go. An excavation of the um, Xinjie archaeological site of Wuxi City in eastern China has unearthed a rare stone axe of the Neolithic Yanzhou culture. Examined on both sides with engraved on both sides with tigers, clouds and birds. Birds and cloud patterns have been found on Yanji ax axes before, but this is the first one with a tiger pattern ever discovered. Discovered during construction work around 2020, obviously we've got the fake demic then, so it wasn't released then. The, the Dinje site was a settlement of the Lanzhou culture about 4,500 years ago. It covered an estimated five acres on the west bank of the Tanhe Lake. Since August 2022, archaeologists have excavated a little less than half an acre of it, uncovering multiple cultural layers, a total of 329 stone axes, a statue of Lloyd George, 73 stone and bone arrowheads, 436 fishing net weights, and numerous ceramic and jade objects. The tiger axe is the most significant find among these artifacts. Both sides feature the same motives in different arrangements. One side as a tiger at the top. There you go, tiger at the top. Um, clouds in the middle. Um, yeah, you can see the clouds. And flying birds at the bottom. So those things at the bottom are flying birds. The other side is the flying birds on top, uh, tigers in the middle, and clouds on the bottom. I think they were smoking weed. Uh, the figures are engraved in a fluid, single line style with fine, smooth lines. Archaeologists believe they were carved with a hard, sharp stone tool. And this was found on top of a sacrificial platform. Um, and there are minor chips and damage to it, this. And this was obviously not used as a tool. It was used pos possibly as some kind of decoration. The, icon the iconograph iconography of the tiger suggests it may have been a symbol representing power. Mm. And finally tonight, we will go to Ireland. And I tell you what, this has bloody worn me out. <laughs> but I tell you what, um, and the lecture this morning, right? I've got to be honest with you, this morning was so difficult. I had to go, to, I had to first of all get to the garage with my exhaust hanging off my car, banging the spring of my, my back wheel, right? Got to the garage. That, um, it, it sounded like a tank. Got to the garage, emptying my stuff in the rain, right? Using my expensive barber jacket to protect my stuff. Sitting on a seat, waiting for the garage to finish an MOT on a car in the pouring rain. Speaking to my daughter, then having to teach you guys in the pouring rain. Luckily, the guy turned up with my car with it repaired. Giving a lecture then. Really stressed out. Driving back. Dealing with my animals. Um, everything else happening, and then giving this lecture this evening. So uh, I, I want think... sympathy. I want sympathy from Henry, but I'm not going to get it. No. So what, what, about the, do... what about the poor mouse? I... Oh, and the poor mouse. Oh yeah, the poor mouse I found yes the other day. Oh, that was wonderful. And the wasp I found hiding on my jacket. I like think we need a day off tomorrow. I need a day off. I, I, I need to lie in, lie in bed with you, Anne, right? You can keep me warm and that'll be great. If not, I'm going to lie in bed with, um, with, with Goff instead. 
Right. OK, so what we're going to do, we're going to go to my emails from Henri. Right. And we're going to tell you about um, a site in Ireland. And I might actually try and find the site in Ireland. So, um, so where's this email? Um, I don't want any invites to any pornographic sites sent to me by Henry. I don't want them. So I don't want them. Um, Henry, right. Hallucinogenic drug. We don't want that, right? So, okay, we'll move on to that one. Um, right, down, Patrick. Here we go. Ah, oh, down, Patrick. Ah, yeah, top of the world, yes, sir. We've got to take the total piss out of this because it's from Ireland. So, here we go. Um, I'll send you another one tonight as well. Oh, yeah, you can bloody keep it. Right, okay. Um, I, I know. Um, we'll do that next week. So what I'm going to do now, we can. Um, I, I send some terrible emails to to um, to our French friend. Right. So we're going to we're going to type in Down Patrick, and then we're going to do the last article. Of, so Down Patrick, um, what we're going to say prehistoric settlement. Down Patrick Cinema. Didn't you burn that down, Anne, when you went there last? <laughs> Here we go. It's the county town of Down. County Down. All right. <laughs> Shut up. Right, so prehistoric park, they got bloody dinosaurs there. Right, okay. Oh. Yeah, they do have an archaeology um, group there, archaeology setup. I've noticed. Yeah, I, I'm glad you know us, Dan. You know, yeah, we all want to know that, right? Um, look at these great images, yeah. And our oh, St. Patrick was buried there as well. Yeah, we love it. And Joe Biden. Who? Joe, Bi Joe Biden's buried there as well. Shut up. Right. OK, anyone watching online, we're coming to the end soon. So if there's anything you want to say online or all, all 10 of you, don't forget to um, subscribe and like. If you want to join the channel, press the blue button at the bottom, uh, £1.99 a month. Um, if you've got any questions online, do them now because we'll be finishing soon. Right. This is um, one of the largest. Oh, here we go. One of the largest prehistoric settlements ever found in Ireland has been uncovered during preparation work for, oh, terrible bloody accent, for a new school in County Down. Archaeologists have excavated the site of the soon to be built New Down High School in Down Patrick and found evidence of the ancient settlement alongside a graveyard dating from the time of the Irish famine. This yeah. has got to be one of the bodies from the Irish famine. One of those excavating the site close to Strangford Road said the Bronze Age site could be the largest in the Third Reich. No, sorry, could be the largest prehistoric settlement yet found anywhere on the island. Mm. Among items found include a burial urn with cremated remains inside, along with a flint arrowhead that is believed to be around 4,001 years old. Christopher Lynn, who worked at the site alongside colleagues from archaeological consultants Gahan and Long, said in an interview with the BBC, the prehistoric finds followed after the discovery of a workhouse graveyard dating to around 1847. And the reason why I wanted to do this today is there's a point to it. And, and, it, and I really start to slag off English and Welsh archaeologists at the end of this lecture. So get ready, because the Irish do things right. And I'm not just doing it to please anybody, I'm saying it because I mean it. Yeah. The graveyard revealed around 950 burials. And here we go. Two, here we go. The burials in these, ah, start again, top of the world to you, sir. The people in these burials, would have died in the workhouse of various illnesses, such as fever, and we can learn quite a lot from them. We had no idea it was there. It proves that we had an urban settlement before the Vikings. Our early Christian Christianity came to Ireland. Top of the world here, sir. Speaking of the much older settlement that was on Earth, Downhill School's deputy head 
Ken Dawson. Now, this is this is why th- this very paragraph mm. is something very important. And it's so, so important. Read this again. The head of Down High School, or the deputy head, Ken Dawson, said, the famine era remains will be reinterred on an adjoining piece of land beside the new school with dignity and respect. We'll read that again. The famine era remains will be reinterred on an adjoining piece of land beside the new school with dignity and respect, Mm -hmm. with plans underway to create a permanent memorial with the new school that will be completed in 2025. Yeah. In Ireland, they do things right. Mm. On the site of the A4226, the old, the old, a, a, the old five mile lane, mm. we were promised an exhibition. Mm. We were promised an on site museum. We were promised a report that would be made properly public, which it hasn't been. We were promised that the human remains, all 500 of them, would be reburied. Those plans have all been shelved. Mm. British archaeologists on the mainland, England and Wales, an an absolute sham. We have got some of the worst archaeological setup in Britain. We have got some of the worst archaeologists in Britain who do really poor archaeology. And the Irish archaeologists in in the rest of Britain um, make us look like absolute amateurs because they've got absolute respect and they rebury the archaeology that they find and they give a site that people can visit and a memorial to the dead buried there. We have nothing like that in England and Wales that I'm aware of from modern projects. Thank you very much for Irish archeology. span And I'm really delightful to give you archeological news from Ireland every week because it's far superior to English and Welsh archeologists working. Um, It's mentioned by Elise O'Leary, Oh, uh, Elise, who, who, who's been following my 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 work, and she's one of our um, who, who joined us online. Like Anne, you have my sympathies and much appreciation for the work and information. Thank you very much, Elise. If nobody else has got any other questions online, thank you very much. Don't forget to like and subscribe and join. Um, what we're going to do now is you guys um, with my class. Now I want you to. Um, Ask any questions, and we've we've got uh, we've got the four or five of you. So we're going to ask from the women amongst us, Henry. Anything you want to say? <laughs> no, thank you very much. It was a, unfortunately from this end of everything was a bit disjointed due to power failures and other uh, issues. So, but uh, I did catch the gist of it mm. with various bits of technology. I have, we, sent you a, I have sent you a little. Um, Another one for you to mull over. Not from Ireland. Oh, bugger. Right. Uh, this, is, this is from uh, headlines. Our team of archaeologists from the University of Chester and Manchester has made discoveries which shed new light on the communities who inhabited Britain after the end of the last ice age. We'll do that next week. Looks good. Mm. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, we'll do that next week. Appreciate everybody's um, input. Thank you very much for that, Henry. Thank um, you. Right. Right, thank you. Uh, what we're going to do, another woman, Anne. Well, I like the way you, you know, put it all together today because you've come around to, you know, incompetent archaeology to good archaeology. You know, it's like it's 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 come full circle. But of course, there's still bad archaeology as well. But um, it's interesting to, to know the history of our, our barrow diggers. And um, yeah, it was, it was very good. They're very good. Uh, and I, I found I, I was cut off for about five minutes. Did you notice? <laughs> uh, yeah, we did. Uh, there was a problem. There, there was a problem with um, Richard authorization because Richard off. I thought he had authorization and he didn't, so it's it's my fault. Um, but anyway, don't worry about that. And one thing I would say about what you just said is that um, 
you are right we managed to come full circle and and, and the point is is that we can clearly see how archaeology can be done properly that's the one point and then the final point is that um um you know we we get good and bad archaeologists we get good and bad metal detecting enthusiasts we get good and bad historians but if you've made mistakes in history and archaeology like i have like we all have um it's best to try and get that sorted out and to get your results out there which 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 i am doing and which we'll be doing yeah. thank you very much for that Anne. Yeah. there's nothing else. Okay. um and then we're going to do um um I, i've just muted dan have i no i haven't um richard anything you want to say uh, yeah, I was reading a piece in Archaeologica Cambrensis, and it refers to a tumulus that was by in Pentrameric, sort of back, sort of um, 1880s, 1890s. So it turns out there's a crowd, crowd of guys that are repairing the road. Yeah. So just in the field adjacent to the road is a tumulus there. So you think, oh, we'll have a look in you, see what's in you. I think the foreman has drifted off. So they virtually destroy it. Find an urn in the middle, smash it open, looking for the treasure and the gold. And so they don't find anything. So just, the foreman comes along and they just use all the rocks from it to repair the road. Mm -hmm. And it's totally mm -hmm. gone. I think a lot I, of that I, 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 on farmland. And... Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that, Richard. Uh, there, there is one thing I'd like to say at Pentra Myrick. When you, when you, uh, at the crossroads at Pentra Myrick, that used to be a police house. Right. And, um, um, and, and basically, if you look directly towards uh, Slizwerny down that road, um, over on the right hand side, there's there's a mound of stones in the field. But I think that's been placed there by the farmer clearing rather than that. I, when you thought when you mentioned that, I thought I know what this is. I, I don't know what this is, but um, yeah. sometimes you get fake mounds and that 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 pile of stones in the field is a fake mound. But mm -hmm. it may have actually been near there. We don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, thank you for that, Richard. Um, and finally, Goff. That was very interesting. I, I like the, the, the little two articles at the end are very interesting. So uh, thanks very much. And, and thank you for that. And guys, next week, uh, we're going to be doing Otzi uh, part three. Um, and I would like to mention as well uh, that I, 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 might, I might be doing um, two walks. One might be the, the archaeology of Barry just looking at excavation places rather than the buildings and just basically saying this is where the excavation was, this was found and basically ignoring the buildings around and I want to do that in Cowbridge as well and if I, I can I, I can it'd be nice saying actually this is this this is the place where the Roman shop front was and the, the Arthur John's this is where the bathhouse used to be just mm. go into these places and just taking you around where showing you where these things were um, and I could do that in Barry. I might do that. That will be in the future, but I haven't got any details on that yet. I won't be doing it in Wick because it's all been blown away. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to say anything? Goff, Richard, uh, Anne, or, uh, or, 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 or uh, Henry? If not, thank you very much, guys. I'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye thank bye. You, uh, thanks thank for joining us. Bye -bye. Effort today. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. You Thank you for everyone's rest. contribution. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care, guys. Bye. 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 Night, 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 Henry. Yeah, I was just waiting for you to go offline. Oh, you want me to go offline? Okay, I will. Okay. Um, we're we're going to, uh, don't forget uh, to subscribe and like. Um, if anyone's got any questions, um, you had your chance. Thank you, Elise, and everybody else online. And don't forget to press the join the join button. Hopefully, you enjoyed your glass of wine. Thank you very much, uh, folks online. We're over and out. Next week, we've got uh, Wednesday at uh, seven twenty-ish until about now. Next week, Tuesday, uh, 
seven thirty ish and until late, and obviously uh, Wednesday morning, approximately eleven o'clock, is it, unless I'm uh, blown away. Thank you very much for joining us this week. I'm going to look in the chat box as usual. Nothing in the chat box, um, and we're going to call this a day.